if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Feel free to use table of contents if you need to, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you in Loudoun and Prince William, Montgomery County, as well as those from Arlington or those online. We invite you to join us in person. It's good to be together around God's Word. We're in week two of this series on living in light of eternity and part two of two specifically in 1 Corinthians 15, asking the question, how do you press on in difficult days? And last week I told you that part one was going to be awesome and part two was going to be awesomer. And so we're at part two today and I set that expectation not because of any confidence in what I have to say, but because of total confidence in what God has to say and the hope that he holds out for us in his word, particularly in the middle of difficult days. And as I approach this text today, I have particular people on my mind and heart. I think about some, many of you who are walking through health challenges right now, some with your physical health, with struggles from COVID to cancer and everywhere in between, others with your emotional health or mental health, maybe struggles with anxiety or depression. And I want to encourage you specifically today, if you fall in any of those categories or all of them, with the hope that through faith in Christ, one day your body, your emotions, and your thoughts are all going to be perfect. Some of you have experienced hurt in certain relationships. And I want to encourage you today that for all who are in Christ, one day all of our relationships with each other will be reconciled. Some of you have lost people you loved, maybe recently or maybe a long time ago. But the grief is still real from then or it's fresh right now. And amidst that grief, I want to encourage you with the hope of where all who have died in Christ are at this moment and what they will one day be with you if you are in Christ. Which leads to one of the main things on my mind and heart. I want to prepare you for the day when your body stops working altogether. So the current death rate in the world is 100%. <laughs> and I don't mean to be disheartening in bringing that up, but I do mean to be eye-opening. D.A. Carson, the author of the devotional that goes along with our Bible reading plan, said whatever the church does, it should prepare people to face death and meet God. And my prayer is that no one would leave here today unprepared for that day, knowing that not one of us, not one of us is guaranteed tomorrow. So I pray that every single person within the sound of my voice would leave here on this day with faith in Jesus that conquers any sense of fear when you think about that day. In a supernatural way, I want to lead you to look forward to that day in a way that enables you to press on in difficult days. So toward that end, let me start with a simple story told by John Newton, author of the prob probably what is the most famous hymn originally written in the English language, Amazing Grace. Newton's mom passed away when he was six years old. He had a pretty rough childhood. And then as a young adult, he found himself captain of a slave trading ship. In a dramatic conversion moment following a violent storm at sea, he came to faith in Jesus. And after that, he became a pastor 
and eventually worked with William Wilberforce to abolish the slave trade in England. One day, he was talking about how to press on through trials and difficult days and the brokenness of this world. And he told a simple story about a man traveling by carriage to New York to take possession of a large estate. Imagine an inheritance worth millions of dollars in that day, hundreds of millions of dollars in our day. So imagine this man traveling for miles in his meager carriage with a smile on his face, thinking, dreaming about, anticipating what was coming, eagerly looking forward to what would soon be his. Then imagine that man rounding a corner overlook and seeing his estate come into sight with that grin now widening on his face from ear to ear. He's almost there. But then, with one short mile to go, imagine this man's carriage hitting a hole in the road and the seat underneath him shaking as the wheels come off and the carriage comes to a halt. The man jumps down off his seat to inspect the wheels only to realize that his carriage is broken down and he'll have to walk the last mile. And then Newton says, what a fool we would think that man if we saw him wringing his hands and blubbering out all the remaining mile. My carriage is broken. My carriage is broken. With an estate worth millions mere minutes away. I start with that story to give you a perspective on this world and our lives in it. A world where so much feels broken, including all the things I mentioned earlier. Broken bodies, emotions, minds, broken friendships, broken families, not to mention all the brokenness we see and evil and suffering in the world and even sometimes what feels like brokenness in the church. Yet in the middle of all of this brokenness, God says to all who trust in him, lift up your eyes and look at the estate that awaits you. God is saying to us today in his word, you are almost there. You're almost there. These days you're walking through in 2020, 2021, not just these days, your life altogether is short. It's a vapor, it's a mist, it's here one second and gone the next. And a future estate awaits that will last forever and that puts everything in this world into completely different perspective. In the next few minutes, God is about to lift our eyes to see what's coming in a way that will transform our perspective on what is. So let's hear God's word to us, starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35. So we're looking at the second half of this chapter now. We looked at the first half last week, and Paul, who's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has just talked about how he's suffering, dying every day, and he's talking about resurrection to come the inheritance that awaits all who trust in Jesus. And he writes, verse 35, someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that it is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. 
It's sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it's not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, the man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Oh, how, how do you get there? How do you hold fast? How do you have immovable faith in a broken world? How do you abound in difficult days? And the answer is in what we just read. And there's so much there that I want to show you, and not just here, but broader biblical background that helps us understand what we just read. So we got a lot of ground to cover in a little bit of time, and we won't have time to turn to all the different places I'm going to reference or even put them all on the screen. And if you're taking notes, which I would encourage you to do because this is truth worth writing down, prepare to write fast. So... Let's go. Let's start with some necessary biblical background to what we just read. So the Bible teaches that all people possess a body and a soul. Think about Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So there's a clear distinction between our bodies and our souls. And the Bible teaches that when, our, when we die, our bodies cease to work. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5, talking about our body as our outer self that is wasting away, as an earthly tent that will one day be destroyed. That's our body. When we die, our bodies cease to work. At the same time, our souls continue to persist. We read this a few weeks ago in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen was being stoned. He cried out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then his body stopped breathing. This is what 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8 is talking about when the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's referring to our souls. So follow this. At the moment of death, here's what happens. At the moment of death, the souls of those who have trusted in Jesus immediately enter the presence of God. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Not tomorrow, not a ways from now. Today you will be with me in paradise. At the moment of death, those who have trusted in Jesus go to be with God. This is why Paul said in, first, in Philippians chapter 1, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far than being here. At the same time, at the moment of death, the souls of those who have not trusted in Jesus 
immediately experience the judgment of God. Let me pause here and speak specifically to anyone listening today who has not put your trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life. Don't miss the big picture of your life here, right where you are sitting. God has created you to know and enjoy him forever. But you, along with every single other person in the world, have sinned against God. We have all turned aside from God and his ways to ourselves and our own ways. The Bible calls this sin. And our sin separates us from God. And if we die in this state of separation from God, we will spend eternity in judgment do our sin. But God loves us. And God has made a way for us to be forgiven of our sin and restored to relationship with him. God has come to us in the person of Jesus. And Jesus has lived the life we could not live, a life of no sin. Then even though he had no sin to die for, Jesus chose to die on a cross for sinners, in the place of sinners. He died the death we deserve to die. And then, three days later, Jesus rose from the grave, conquering the enemy we could not conquer, death itself, so that anyone, anywhere, no matter who you are or what you have done, you turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. God will forgive you of all your sin and restore you to relationship with him forever. And that relationship can be possible for you today through faith in, trust in Jesus and God's love for you. I urge you, to put your trust in Jesus. And not just me. The souls of all who have died without faith in Jesus are urging you to trust in Jesus today. Luke 16 makes clear. Jesus tells the story of a rich man and Lazarus that the souls of those who do not trust in Jesus immediately experience the judgment of God when they die, and they are wishing right now that they could send a message to family members or friends who have not trusted in Jesus, pleading for you to trust in him. If you have a friend or family member who died without trusting in Jesus, Luke 16 makes clear that they are longing right now for you to trust in God's love for you. For they know that at the moment of death, the souls of those who have trusted in Jesus immediately enter the presence of God and the souls of those who have not trusted in Jesus immediately experience the judgment of God. Trust in God's love for you in Jesus today. Don't wait another day. And then at the same time, we need to see that while these realities are true at the moment of death, the story is not over for those who have died. Yes, it's over in the sense that people will not have another opportunity to trust in Jesus, but the story is not over in that their bodies will one day be resurrected, either to experience everlasting judgment or everlasting life. And 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrected bodies of those who have trusted in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, along with the rest of the Bible, is saying that when Jesus returns, our bodies will be resurrected and reunited with our souls. This is what we read last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 and 23. I'll put it up here just as a reminder. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So follow this. Jesus, Christ, was raised from the dead. His resurrection was the firstfruits the foretaste of resurrection from the dead to come for those who belong to Christ. And when Jesus returns at his coming, those who belong to Christ shall be made alive. And that's not talking about the resurrection of our souls. That's talking about the resurrection of our bodies. That's the whole point here. There were people in Corinth, Christians, who were thinking only the soul was immortal. But the Bible's saying here, 
That wasn't the case with Christ. His body is risen, and it's not the case with Christians. Their bodies will be risen, so follow this. What the Bible is teaching here is that most followers of Jesus will die. And I emphasize most because Jesus is going to come back one day, and some of his people will be alive on that day. So what we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52, for I tell, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We will not all die. We shall all be changed, though, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Oh, wouldn't that be the awesome mess to be among those living when Jesus comes back? to hear that trumpet and see that sight. Like, maybe, so maybe we'd like, may it happen today. May we walk out of this room after singing in worship and hearing God's word and the trumpet sounds. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. So most followers of Jesus will die. Not all. Regardless, though, all followers of Jesus will be resurrected. When Jesus returns, all followers of Jesus will receive a resurrected body. This is the same thing that the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, 14 through 17. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who fall asleep, who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So you put this together with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you realize that those who are alive when Jesus returns will be physically transformed in their bodies, while those who are dead when Jesus returns will be physically reunited with their bodies. The Bible is teaching here that just as Jesus' body was raised from the dead, so our bodies will be raised from the dead. And this changes the way we think about death and even people who have died. I think many Christians have the idea, maybe in the back of our minds, that even when people die in Christ, that they go to heaven and the story is over for them. But it's not. The story's not over for them. They are waiting and they are longing for the resurrection of their bodies. There's still more story to come for them and us with them. And this changes the way we think and talk about heaven. We don't need to think about heaven in merely spiritual terms. Yes, for a time, but ultimately, we need to be thinking about heaven as a physical place. We're not just going to be ambiguous spirits floating around on clouds, staring at light and singing songs for a few quadrillion years. No, we're going to have real, physical, new bodies and a real, physical, new earth, which is why we don't say, I'll never have the opportunity to hug my husband or wife or mom or dad or child again. Not true. If they were in Christ, you will absolutely hug them again. You will hold them again. We don't, we don't say, I'll never see that person I loved again. If they were in Christ, you will see them in more glorious ways than you have ever seen them before. Physical resurrection is coming for all who put their trust in Jesus. Which makes us wonder then, well, what will our resurrection bodies be like? And what we have here in 1 Corinthians 15 is the answer to that question. Now, before we think about what 1 Corinthians 15 is telling us, Let's realize that in this passage, God is not going to tell us every single detail that we might wonder or ask about. Instead, he gives us a foundation here. And I would just say, based on the goodness of God, the greatness of God, and his love for us, we don't have anything to worry about when it comes to what our resurrected bodies might look like. 
He's our creator. He knows what he's doing. And he desires our good for all of eternity. And with that in mind, he gives us this foundation. What does God tell us about our resurrected bodies in his word? Well, according to 1 Corinthians 15, our resurrection bodies will be similar yet different. So this passage starts by talking about agriculture, like the seed of a plant that grows into something different from that seed, but still similar to that seed. Just think of an example. You plant a watermelon seed. It eventually comes out a watermelon, something that's very different, far greater, but not different in kind. It's still a watermelon seed. Then he uses illustrations of humans and fish and animals and stars and the sun and the moon. And he makes the point that we will have bodies in heaven as we have had bodies on earth. So there's similarity, but there are also differences. But what will be the same? Well, we know that our bodies will be physically recognizable. Jesus' body was physically recognizable when he rose from the grave. In Matthew chapter 8, he just talks about how Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be recognizable around the table in heaven. Just as Moses and Elijah are recognized by Peter in Luke chapter 9. Genesis 1 makes clear that we are each made uniquely, beautifully, wonderfully, Psalm 139 says, in the image of God as male and female, even according to different ethnicities, that will be maintained. Revelation chapter seven describes all the tribes and peoples gathered around God's throne with all their beautiful distinctions. So we will be physically recognizable. Similar in that way, yet different in far greater ways. And that's what Paul, that's why Paul uses the language here in verse 52 about those who are alive in Christ when he returns will be changed because there will be a fundamental transformation of our bodies for eternity. You say, well, what are the differences then? And the Bible elaborates, showing us that our resurrection bodies will be eternal. Verse 42 says, these bodies perish. Our resurrection bodies will never perish. Every person eventually feels the fading of this body. Can I get an amen to that? As our bodies age, we deteriorate in different ways. But that will never be the case with our resurrection bodies. They will be completely healthy, completely strong forever. No more aches, no more pains, no more masks, ever, ever, ever. No more need for them. With all due respect to the doctors and nurses in our church family, you will one day be out of a job for eternity. Because resurrection bodies will never, ever break down. I think about the encouragement and this truth for all of us, whenever we have an ache or a pain or as we walk through a global pandemic, or I think about those with special needs or physical disabilities or those who've gone before us and died in Christ and we saw their bodies in such hurt and pain. Johnny Erickson Tata, quadriplegic sister in Christ, talks about the hope of an imperishable body this way. She says, I still can hardly believe it. I, with shriveled, bent fingers, atrophied muscles, gnarled knees, and no feeling from the shoulders down, will one day have a new body, light, bright, and clothed in righteousness, powerful and dazzling. Can you imagine the hope that gives someone with a spinal cord injury like me, or someone who is cerebral palsied, brain injured, or has multiple sclerosis. Imagine the hope this gives someone who is manic depressive. No other religion, no other philosophy promises new bodies, hearts, and minds. Only in the gospel of Christ do hurting people find such incredible hope. It's exactly what 1 Corinthians 15 is teaching. Keep going here, our resurrection bodies will not just be eternal, our resurrection bodies will be beautiful. Verse 43 says they will be raised in glory. What a picture, radiating glory and beauty. And when you think beauty here, don't think 
the vain beauty like so many seek in this world. Think a real deep beauty, like the glory that shone from Moses' face in Exodus 34. Or how both Daniel or even Jesus are described as shining like the sun or brightness in the sky. Just imagine the sinless beauty of the soul overflowing into the perfect beauty of the body. We won't have to try to look beautiful. We will be beautiful, glorious. Our resurrection bodies will be powerful. Verse 43, this body is weak. Our resurrection body will be raised in power. Which doesn't necessarily mean we're all gonna have bodybuilder types, but our resurrection bodies will be strong, free from any physical weakness we are familiar with in this world. Again, Johnny Erickson Tata writes, Used this quote before, it's one of my favorites from her. She said, I hope in some way I can take my wheelchair to heaven. With my new glorified body, I will stand up on resurrected legs and I will be next to the Lord Jesus and I will feel those nail prints in his hands and I will say, thank you, Jesus. He will know I mean it because he will recognize me from the inner sanctum of sharing in the fellowship of his sufferings. He will see that I was one who identified with him in the sharing of his suffering, so my gratitude will not be hollow. And then I will say, Lord Jesus, do you see that wheelchair over there? Well, you were right. When you put me in it, it was a lot of trouble. But the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. I do not think I would have ever known the glory of your grace were it not for the weakness of that wheelchair. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. And now, if you like, you can send that thing off to hell. (laughs) If I could just shout a loud amen right now on behalf of Marissa, who's not able to be here this morning. Our resurrection bodies will never need a wheelchair. It will be eternal, beautiful, powerful, Our resurrection bodies will be perfectly spirit-filled. That's what the Bible means by emphasizing over and over again this spiritual body. It doesn't mean non-physical. It means perfectly filled with the spirit. Just think of it. Perfectly filled with God's spirit. We will be absolutely free from sin in our bodies. Nothing unclean in heaven, Revelation 21 and 22 say. Our bodies perfectly robed in righteousness, the very righteousness of Jesus himself, totally untouched even by temptation. The devil and his attacks will have no more influence on us. We will be free not just from sin, but any temptation to sin, which means we will be utterly free to obey God, experiencing true freedom, what it means to be made in the image of God free from sin, temptation. Paul Helm put it this way. He said, the freedom of heaven is the freedom from sin. Not that the believer just happens to be free from sin, but that he or she is so constituted or reconstituted that he or she cannot sin. He or she doesn't want to sin. And he or she does not want to want to sin. In our resurrected bodies, sin will be literally unthinkable to us and wholly undesirable to us. We will be perfectly spirit-filled, and our resurrection bodies will be permanently Christ-like. That's the whole point of what the Bible is saying here in this comparison between the first Adam and the second Adam, Adam who led humanity into sin, Jesus who delivered humanity from sin. And just as he was raised from the dead, so also all who trust in him will be raised to live as he lives. This is Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. That's our country that we belong to. That's where our citizenship is, and we're waiting for transformation of our bodies to be like his. 1 John 3 says, when we see him, we shall be like him. Amen. Which, which means, like picture Jesus, perfectly human. We will be 
perfectly human. Our resurrection bodies will be ultimately complete in every way. Just, just let this soak in. Meditate on this. Just soak it in and be encouraged by it. One day, our minds will be perfect. No more mental illness. No more battles with worry or anxiety that cause you to toss and turn in the night or make you wonder if you want to get out of the bed the next day. No more depression. No more deception. Just true thoughts. True thoughts about God. We saw this in 1 Corinthians 13. Now we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now, don't miss this. When 1 Corinthians 13 says that we shall know fully, that doesn't mean that with resurrected bodies, with perfect minds in heaven, we will suddenly become omniscient like God. We're not becoming God here. The point of this passage is that our knowledge of God will be true without any error or misconception. But mark it down, our knowledge of God will never be total. And here's why. Psalm 145 verse 3 tells us God's greatness is unsearchable. Ephesians 2 says the riches of his grace are immeasurable. Which means, so follow this, the greatness of God can be searched and the grace of God can be measured for millions of years. And after millions of years, you know what? There will still be more greatness to search and still be more grace to measure because our God is infinitely great and he is infinitely gracious. And think about how this affects the way we think about heaven and the joy of heaven. It's one of my favorite quotes from Stephen Sharnak's Discourse on the Eternity of God. It's this thick volume. It would take like an eternity to read it. But listen to what he says. And, and I'll go and tell you this quote, is, it gets kind of wordy, but it's worth it. Just follow along. He said, when we enjoy God, we enjoy him in his eternity without any flux. Time is fluid but eternity is stable. And after many ages, the joys will be as savory and satisfying as if they had been at that moment first tasted by our hungry appetites. When the glory of the Lord shall rise upon you, it shall be so far from ever setting that after millions of years are expired, as numerous as the sands on the seashore, the sun and the light of whose countenance you shall live shall be as bright as at the first appearance. He will be so far from ceasing to flow that he will flow as strong, as full, as at the first communication of himself in glory to the creature. God is always vigorous and flourishing, a pure act of life, sparkling new and fresh rays of life and light to the creature, flourishing with a perpetual spring, contenting the most capacious desire, forming your interest, pleasure, and satisfaction with an infinite variety without any change or succession. He will have variety to increase delights and eternity to perpetuate them. This will be the fruit of the enjoyment of an infinite and eternal God. Just in case you didn't follow that, for all of eternity, we will discover more and more and more greatness and beauty and grace and grandeur and love and holiness in God. A million years from now, there will be more to see and 10 quadrillion years from now, whatever that is, there will be more to see. God will never grow old in his glory, beauty, majesty before our eyes. Our God is so great, and we will have true thoughts about him. And flowing from that, true thoughts about ourselves. No longer Satan's lies about who we are or how we're not enough how we're to this or to that. No, 
we will know ourselves as God our Father knows and loves us. Our minds will be perfect. Contemplate the mental wonder of a resurrected body. And not just our minds, our emotions will be pleasing. Just think about our emotions in a resurrected body. Think in light of Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So when we delight ourselves in God, we find all the desires of our heart fulfilled. The problem is, in this sinful world, our delight is in God is imperfect. We are tempted to delight in other things in this world other than God, which affect us negatively, which promise us satisfaction, but always and ultimately fail us. We think money, sex, fame, position, power, whatever it might be, that'll satisfy. And maybe it does for a moment, but it fades, it fades, it fades. Our hearts are designed to be fulfilled in the unfading God. And in resurrected bodies, we will perfectly delight in God in a way that all the desires of our hearts will be completely fulfilled in him. Jesus promises this in Luke chapter 6. Blessed are those who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. You leap for joy. How do you do that? How do you leap for joy when you're being slandered, when you're being hated, when you're being persecuted? How do you leap for joy? Behold, your reward is great in heaven. Your reward is great in a place where he will wipe away every tear from your eye and there will be no more mourning and no more crying, no more emotional pain or hurt anymore. In the words of Adoniram Judson, who died as a missionary to Myanmar, when Christ calls me home, I shall go with the gladness of a boy bounding away from school. Do you realize what... Seeing here, just think about our emotions in our resurrected bodies. Our wants will be fully trustworthy. I say that again. Our wants will be fully trustworthy. We will want in our resurrected bodies only what God wants, which means we will not have to question whether or not what we want is good. For us, good for others. I love the way Andy Alcorn puts this in a book he wrote on heaven. He said, one of the greatest things about heaven is that we'll no longer have to battle our desires. They'll always be pure, attending to their proper objects. We'll enjoy food without gluttony and eating disorders. We'll express admiration and affection without lust, fornication, or betrayal. Those things simply won't exist. This is why C.S. Lewis, imagining this reality, wrote in the Chronicles of Narnia that Lucy said, I have a feeling we've got to the country where everything is allowed. What Augustine talked about in the fourth century will finally be true. Love God and do as you please. With the resurrected bodies, our minds perfect, our emotions pleasing, and our relationships will be pure. All who've trusted in Jesus will be fully reunited with, reconciled to one another, loving each other perfectly out of the overflow of God's perfect love for us. Think about Mark 10. The Bible describes us with the resurrected bodies as an infinitely glad family before an infinitely good Father. Revelation 19 describes us together as a spotless bride before our sinless Savior. Revelation chapter seven describes us as a unique people from every nation and a historic ancestry from every generation. Jonathan Edwards put it this way, just imagine 
every Christian friend that goes before us from this world is a ransomed spirit waiting to be reunited with us with resurrected bodies in heaven. There will be the infinite of days that we have lost below through grace to be found above. There the Christian father and mother and wife and child and friend with whom we shall renew the holy fellowship of the saints which was interrupted by death here but shall be commenced again in the upper sanctuary and then shall never end. There we shall have companionship with the patriarchs and saints of the Old and New Testaments, and those of whom the world was not worthy. And there, above all, we shall enjoy and dwell with God our Father, whom we have loved with all our hearts on earth, and with Jesus Christ, our beloved Savior, who has always been to us the chief among ten thousands and altogether lovely, and with the Holy Spirit, our sanctifier and guide and comforter, and we shall all be filled with all the fullness of the Godhead forever. Do we realize what God is saying to us today in difficult days in a broken world? God is telling us right now, when you face difficult days, when you feel the brokenness of this carriage known as your body or this world or the things in it, Lift your eyes and look at the inheritance that's coming really, really soon. It's in your sights. And press on this last mile. The words we used last week, press on with risk-taking, trial-enduring, death-defying obedience to Jesus. Amidst inevitable hardship in this world, that Jesus told us would come, John 16, in this world you will have tribulation. He told us you will have trial, you will have trouble, you will feel brokenness in your body, in your mind, your emotions, in your relationships, and you will see it all around you in this world. But Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, next words, but take heart. I have overcome this world. Amen. Jesus says, I have come into this world. Even without sin, I have experienced pain and suffering in this world to the point of death on a cross for you. But Jesus says, pain and suffering and death did not have the last word for me and they will not have the last word for you. Jesus says, lift your eyes and look ahead to your home, to your inheritance that I have bought for you, prepared for you. You're on the last mile, so press on. Amidst inevitable hardship in this world with unshakable hope in the world to come. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find until after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of my life to press on to that other country and to help others do the same. John Newton had the same perspective. And God is calling us today to live with this perspective. Do you remember the words to his most famous hymn? Instead of constantly saying, my carriage is broken, my carriage is broken, let's choose to sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. I have new sight. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. He will lead me home. Will you bow your heads with me? Just between you and God, right where you're sitting, or this room, other rooms, online, wherever you are right now, between you and God,
do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today, if something were to happen to you on the drive home, do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you would go to be with God? Because you would put your faith in Jesus. If the answer to that question is not an overwhelming, resounding yes in your heart, then I wanna invite you right now in this holy moment just to say to God, in your heart, right where you're sitting, just say, God, I have sinned against you. And I want to be restored to you today. Today, just to say in your heart, today, God, I believe that you have sent Jesus to die on a cross for my sins, to rise from the grave so that I could have eternal life with you. And just say to him, God, forgive me of my sins. Restore me to relationship with you today. I want to experience eternal life in you starting right now. And you express that in your heart to God. The Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord in this way will be saved. You confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. We are adopted into the family of God by faith in Jesus. Oh God, I pray that that adoption is happening all across this room, other rooms, online, just all kinds of different places right now by the power of your spirit. You're bringing people to faith in you, to know you, not just now, but for trillions of years from now, we'll be looking back to this day as the day when that new life happened. And God, for all who have trusted in you today and all have trusted in you, Lord Jesus, in days past, we praise you for your word praise you for not leaving us alone in a world of suffering and sin and sorrow and pain, hurt and difficult days. God, we praise you that you are with us. You are familiar with our suffering, Lord Jesus, and that you have made a way for us to have a hope no matter what happens in this world. We praise you, Jesus, for turning the worst thing that could happen to us, death, into the very best thing that could happen to us. Eternal life with you, with the resurrected body ultimately forever. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We pray, bring it into this world of sin and suffering. Bring a new heaven and a new earth. And we pray that you'd help us to walk faithfully, to hold fast, to be immovable and abound in your work until that day. Help us to lead others to you until that day with urgency. God, we pray this week you would help us not to be silent with this gospel, to spread this gospel with urgency. God, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan right now who are experiencing all kinds of persecution. God, we pray that you'd give them hope in the middle of difficult days. And God, we pray for the spread of your mercy and your grace and the gospel through them. From here to there, from our city to the nations, God, use us, spend our lives for the spread of this gospel hope as we look forward to the day when we will gather around your throne with every nation, tribe, and tongue. We will see you in all of your glory and be with you forever. Hasten the coming of that day, we pray, and help us to be faithful, to hold fast until that day. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.